All right, I'm going to be handing um, you over to the audience who are all waiting very eagerly for your presentation. So everyone presenting Beck and Bird Suniki from the Google Open Source Programs Office. Thank you, is that my intro to take over? Okay, great. Um, I can't see anyone, so let me just start by saying how grateful I am to be included in today's program and to be able to dial in Berkeley. And I'm wishing everyone great health and happiness, and hopefully I will be with you all at your next event. Um, and today I want to spend some time and talk about leadership and open source. And there is no better time than now to learn how we can all be leaders especially during these times of ambiguity. Um, so let me just dive in since we don't have a lot of time. And so my, my main question is, is, how many of you have thought, I wish someone would just lead, just pick a direction or just fix something, get people working better together? I know I have. I've definitely had those thoughts and those feelings before, and it can be really frustrating. But I want to use this time to let you know that you can be the leader that we all need. And today, I'd like to share some of Google's leadership resources so that you can learn a little bit about what leadership is. But before I go too far, I just first want to thank everyone for making time today to learn about leadership skills. Because when we become stronger leaders, our communities become more healthy and our projects become more sustainable. So with this talk, I wanna cover three things. What is leadership? How you can strengthen your leadership skills? And I want to provide some tips that you can take away today to start applying in your projects as you work with others. So hopefully that sounds good. And um, I'm gonna assume it is. And let's just keep going. And I want to talk about leadership by illustrating it through a story that um, I picked up along the way in my last 10 years working in open source. So I was helping a project improve their contributor experience. And we did this by interviewing a lot of contributors. And there was one story in particular that stood out to me. And it was someone who was a new contributor and they really wanted to participate in a project. Uh, but they were looking around in the forums and the issues and they, found, they felt really overwhelmed. They felt that it was like a brand new language. They felt that the interactions, especially with newcomers were challenging. And they, uh, they got nervous, they were intimidated and they just stayed away. And they watched from afar for an entire year. And then they realized, okay, this is not working and I really wanna do this. So they made a decision to get help and they reached out to a mentor and said, hey, I really would like to contribute. I have this vision for myself that I can be part of this project, but would you walk me through the steps? And this person was you know, inspired, they donated time and they helped this person who could finally go from being fearful to actually making their first contribution, which is great. Um, but it also, um, you know, is unfortunate they had to take an entire year. This person though, as they worked with the mentor, they had a real great learning mindset and they really made sure they understood the steps. And so after they contributed the first time, they did it again and again and again. And today, this person is a top contributor for this open source project, which I think is just a phenomenal story. And this person really persevered in order to accomplish this. But it's also really unfortunate that this person had such a hard experience at the beginning. And you know, I wonder how many contributions were lost because this person waited an entire year. 400 commits a year. And I also wonder how many contributions were lost because people did not push through. 
they walked away. It was like a contributor bounce rate. And the answer is just too many. We don't know, but it's just too many. So it doesn't matter what this project is. It's really so many projects that I've talked to that have this challenge. And it's a real shame because the story didn't have to be this way. Because, you know, open source is all about giving and helping. And people want to do the right thing. It's just that sometimes when we step into help, we are actually stepping up into leadership roles. And we don't know it. We don't realize it. And we don't realize that we're in those roles that we're having an impact on people. The way we talk, models, the culture that we're seeing this project should have and how we should treat each other. And we might have an impact on someone just through our own interactions. And it's unfortunate because in open source, we don't have training. We might have mentors that teach us how to contribute, but we don't actually have training of core skills like leadership, which is really unfortunate. And it's also one of the reasons why I like to give this talk, just to start to shine a light on that we need to focus on the core skills as well as the technical skills when we're working in open source. So I'd like to just start to use this story to unpack what leadership is. And let's start with who were the leaders in this story? And there were quite a few leaders. One was the forum moderator or the people in the issue queues that were interacting with others in those different channels. And they may not have done the best job. They might have the best intentions, but it may not have been the best leadership skills being used there, which is what made that person feel intimidated to begin. Uh, the mentor was a leader, they heard someone say, will you help me? And they said, I have expertise and I will take time and I will help you, which is wonderful. And then there was another leader in this, which might be a little surprising, but that's the contributor, the individual who was able to lead themselves to get from fear into action and impact. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what that means to be a leader in open source as an individual contributor. So let's start by asking, what is leadership? Now there's many definitions out there, so there's, there's not really one to point to, but this one happens to be my favorite. Leadership is a process of social influence, which maximizes the efforts of others towards the achievement of a goal. And this is by Kevin Cruz, who's a leadership expert. And the reason I like this is because it is about influence. You can lead from anywhere. It's not about authority in the role or position that you have. And it's about working with others and influencing others towards a common goal that you both want to achieve together. And sometimes to understand what something is, it's good to see what it is not. So leadership, as I said, it's not a title, it's not a role. It's also not a specific personality type. It's not all of the extroverts out there. You can be an introvert and also be a leader. It's also important to note that leadership is not management. It is not about making sure people do things on time and on budget. That's management. And leadership is not about power. It is not about commanding that people do things. It is about influencing. That's where real transformational change happens. And there are three types of leadership. There's the kind that we know the most, leading organizations, whether it's a CEO or a BDFL of a community, or maybe it's the board and the executive director of an open source foundation. Another type of leadership is leading others. So this might be a product manager at a company that's working across many functions, marketing and sales, engineering, lots of different functions to create and push a product out to market. In open source, it might be managing a bunch of mentors, working in a group of tech writers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third one is leading yourself. 
And this is what that contributor did in the story that I told. They led themselves, they were able to manage their emotions and work with others to create an outcome that they wanted to create. And what's important about these three levels is that you can't lead others until you can lead yourself. And that's because the higher up you go, the more people you start leading, the more responsibilities you take on with your leadership, the more stress you take on and the more responsibility. And you have to stay calm and centered and be able to make decisions in hard times so that people feel confident and can follow you, want to follow you, and you know where to send them. You know how to point them in the right direction and get them working and focused. And that takes self-leadership to do that, really knowing how to control those emotions. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this level, the leading yourself aspect today. So as we're leading, what do leaders do? Well, you'll see it was very much illustrated in the story. They shape a vision, they translate that vision into strategy, they get others to help them, um, you know, work towards that vision. They have measurable results. They know what success looks like and they focus on that. And as they're working, they foster innovation and learning and they lead themselves while they do all of this. And that's exactly what the individual contributor did in my story. Their vision was, I want to contribute. And they came up with a strategy. I'm going to ask a mentor to help me. I'm going to get out of this whole frozen state that I'm in. And they recruited the mentor. And that mentor said, yes, I will help you. I will be part of your team. And they had a very measurable result, one contribution, right? And this contributor had that learning mindset. He learned how to make that one contribution. And then he did it again and again and again to make him now a top contributor on this project. And he did all of this by leading himself. He knew he was scared and he knew he was stuck. And he did he managed those emotions and came up with a strategy to move forward. So he achieved his vision. And so as leaders do what they do, they have to use leadership skills. And these are some leadership skills that are identified from research from the Harvard Business Review. And so you'll see um, a lot of it is inspire and motivate, display integrity and honesty, drive results, communicate, collaborate, build relationships, and lots more. And what I find interesting about this list is it's not about the technical skills that you have. It is about your core skills, your ability to work with others. And additional research looked into this and found that two thirds of leadership is dependent on emotional intelligence, which is really interesting because we don't talk about emotional intelligence very much in open source. We actually don't even talk about it much in society as a whole, which is a whole other problem. What we focus on a lot are our cognitive abilities. And that's because we are really good at solving problems. We even celebrate it. But if we wanna be leaders in open source at any level, we clearly need to focus on emotional intelligence if we wanna be better leaders in open source. And clearly we should want good emotional intelligence. Because according to Dan Goleman, who wrote the book on emotional intelligence, he said that it's emotional intelligence that makes us top performers. And it makes our contribution stronger to our project when we have emotional intelligence. And so he says that it's actually the difference between what makes you a good contributor and a great contributor. Like 90% of that difference is emotional intelligence. And the best way to explain this is if there were two people in the audience that had the same cognitive abilities, but the person on the right, emotional intelligence, they're going to make a stronger impact in the project. And that's because they're going to know how to 
work with others and set that vision and influence others to rally around that vision and make it happen. And when you work with others, you make a stronger impact than when you work alone. So while our cognitive abilities are great in open source and we solve so many hard problems with them, ultimately we need to focus on emotional intelligence. Our cognitive skills will only get us so far, but our emotional intelligence can grow. And that's the great thing is that we actually can grow our emotional intelligence skills by practicing it. So I wanna dive in a little bit into, well, what is this emotional intelligence that makes us better leaders? And simply put, it's being able to understand your emotions and the effect on others, as well as your ability to understand and influence the emotion of others. And this is all comes from Dan Goldman's book, Emotional Intelligence. And he breaks emotional intelligence down into five pillars, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, which are all related to managing your emotions. The other two pillars are empathy and having social skills. And this is about influencing the emotions of others. And you really need to have strength in all five pillars to be really strong in emotional intelligence. But we don't have enough time to get into all of this. So I'm just gonna focus on self-awareness and self-regulation because really they are two sides of the same coin. And what research shows is that when you strengthen these two pillars, you have created the foundation to unlock and strengthen the others. So you have to start here anyhow. So self-awareness is the ability to recognize your feelings and the effect on others. And people with self-awareness have more confidence. They have a more realistic assessment of themselves. And probably for that reason, people with more self-awareness are able to laugh at themselves. They can accept that they're human and what they're good at, what they're not good at. And um, that is an element of self-awareness to focus on. Whereas self-regulation is the ability to control and shift your emotion so you can have a positive interaction with someone else. And people who can self-regulate are more comfortable with ambiguity and change. Um, they can definitely see that there's something happening and they can control those emotions and they can figure out how to respond versus react, which we'll get into later. So you can see the self-awareness and self-regulation, that those two work hand in hand. And the contributor was definitely self-aware enough to realize he was stuck. He was emotionally frozen. And then he used self-regulation to work through his fear and ask for help and convince someone, or I should say influence someone to donate a few hours of their time to help him with this goal. So that is areas we really want to focus on if we wanna grow our emotional intelligence. So before we talk about how to do that, I just wanna, I won't be able to see you. So we'll just kind of use a little trust here. So how would you rate your self-awareness? You can think about that a bit. Maybe you wanna raise your hand if you have, if you think you rate high with self-awareness, like if you think you have strong self-awareness. Well, I can't see what the room is doing, but if you don't have a lot of people raising their hands, that's okay. Because according to Dan Goldman's research, only 36% of people identify as having strong self-awareness. So that is rather curious. It explains a lot about interactions in general and why we sometimes have conflicts as humans. And but the nice thing is that we can raise that number through practice. And interestingly, the best way to improve self-awareness, self-regulation, and therefore emotional intelligence is through mindfulness, which I was um, 
rather surprised with when I started doing this research myself. And when someone told me to practice mindfulness, they recommended journaling, meditating, yoga. And I'm thinking, well, I want to be a good leader, but I don't want to like just, you know, sit quietly or do these things. Like I want to do, I want to be, I'm very action oriented. I want to do something. And so I had a really hard time with this concept. And I kind of dug in a little bit more and Google has done a lot of research in this area and they have actually embraced mindfulness because they have found the impacts from a neuro, uh, neuroscientific perspective and how calming the limbic system with mindfulness allows you to control your emotions much better and therefore be a better leader in times of chaos and change and ambiguity. And um, as I was looking into this research and I'm thinking, I don't know, like this isn't for me, I'm not gonna practice mindfulness to be a leader. Like I get the logic, but like to actually change my behavior, that's a lot harder. And I needed to have a stronger why to get me to change. And I wanted to share that with you uh, in case that just hearing like, oh, just do some yoga, you'll be a better leader. <laughs> isn't resonating with you either. So let me, um, share a little bit about Dan Siegel. So he is a psychiatrist and a leader in interpersonal neurobiology. And he has a whole way of explaining how the brain works, how mindfulness works, and how it can make you a better leader. And he does it with this simple um, hand demonstration. So I'll, I'll do this, but I also have the picture available in case you can't see me very well. Um, so he illustrates the brain using a hand and um, the arm and the wrist is your spinal cord going into the base of your skull. Let me see if I can an angle is better. It goes into the base of your skull and your thumb is your limbic system and that's your fight, flight, freeze. And your hand and the four fingers, that is your cortex. And then the fingernails, where the fingers are touching the thumb, that's your prefrontal cortex. This cortex, the prefrontal cortex, refers to as the upstairs brain, and the thumb, the limbic system, as the downstairs brain. And when you have this integrated brain, you have a system that's really working well and giving you emotional intelligence. Because when the prefrontal cortex is connected to the limbic system, you have a positive feedback loop. So all day long, you are getting triggered and signals are going into your brain and they go into your limbic system and it's saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, something is happening. But your upstairs brain is saying, it's okay, you've been here before. It's using all the logic and reasoning. And it knows how to soothe itself. And when you have this connection with the prefrontal cortex, the front part, it is able to provide all of your emotional intelligence, your self-awareness, your self-regulation, your empathy. And it allows you to engage with the world around you in a really mindful, responsive way instead of a reactive way. But this stimulus, these impacts are coming at us Make you upset. It might be that you're working from home and you're. It might be that you have kids at home really hard. It could be a, a, that response. To you. And eventually, this whole integrated brain it pops and you flip your lid. And there's always just that one thing that flips your lid. Today for me was the dog barking because we have a lot more activity going on in our house right now. And I flipped my lid and I had to take a break. And it can take up to 20 minutes for your body to, and to get that integrated brain. And so I what's going on in the brain and that when we can be when we flip our lid, turn to this, this integrated brain a lot faster 
and we can regain that emotional intelligence and be able to be more self-aware, self-regulated, empathetic as we work with people. We're able to respond versus react. And that is what mindfulness does to our brain and why we need a mindfulness practice so that we aren't flipping our lids all the time. Because so often we're just going through the day like this, totally run by emotion. And that is not helpful to anyone. Oh, there's the flip your lid. And in open source, we really need to know how to keep this integrated brain and avoid flipping the lid. Because we work in an asynchronous and online environment. And unfortunately, that is going to make us flip our lid more because there's a lot of things that happen to our brain when we aren't interacting with someone in person. So whether we're working on GitHub or Slack or Twitter or email, like all these online channels, we're really at a disadvantage because we are suffering from something called online inhibition effect. So our brains, that cortex, is always looking for cues, um, social cues, when we're talking to people so that we can self-regulate. So if someone looks a little upset or maybe they're really happy, we know how to respond. And it, it's what our brain is constantly looking for. And we get that a bit with video, which is good. But when we are on email and Twitter and whatnot, we don't have it. And our brains have a really hard time functioning. And we try emoticons, but that is not what the brain needs to stay the integrated brain. And so what's there's a lot of things that happen as we're working asynchronously and online. Um, and a few that I want to point out from this disinhibition effect is, first of all, lack of eye contact reduces our empathy for the person that we're engaging with. And so because of that, we are already engaging with people with less understanding of where they're coming from. We're a little bit more worried about our response and what we're getting out of the communi communications than what they're saying. So we have this lowered empathy when we're engaging with each other. The other thing is, there's this weird thing we do that we project a voice onto others. So if someone's emailing you or there's a tweet, research shows that nine out of 10 times, we are ascribing a more negative voice to that message than they intended. So we're not empathetic and we don't really have full trust of their intentions. And that's, those are some big headwinds to work with, with online communication. And then there's a third thing that happens, which is as we're working with each other and we're going back and forth, let's say it's Twitter. There's something that happens where the brain flips the lid and you are just run by your emotions. And suddenly your argument on Twitter is really about survival in terms of how the brain functions and thinks. And so survival means winning the argument at all costs. And you've seen this. It's a very strange and unfortunate phenomenon called flame wars, but that's what's to win. It's really hard to stop that. And that is when we get to the worst uh, interactions with each other. And this is where we need a mindfulness practice. This is where we really need to be self-aware. Each other, we have all these headwinds around empathy and, and trusting people's intentions and their communication. And we need to make sure we're not flipping our lid all the time. And we need to build up a practice to keep that integrated brain as we're working together. And so mindfulness in itself is a good practice and you know we don't have a lot of time to go into that. I highly mindfulness is what once you're in a calm with people on the resource project, 
you also need strategies for how to you know, how to collaborate well area we don't get a lot of training on and so my pro tips are that you want to reset if something's triggered you and you have to be self-aware if something has triggered you and so there are ways to calm down so that you can kind of keep that integrated brain and some simple ones are count to 10. I think we've all heard this. Another one is take some deep breaths. And there's a lot of science coming out around how breathing can really help, especially if you take a shorter breath in and a longer breath out. And um, sometimes things that just make you flip your lid are so great. You need more than 10 seconds and you should maybe take a walk around the block. And then my favorite is, Sip hot tea. And the reason for this is that when you have hot tea, you are so focused on the moment of not burning your mouth that you slow everything down and just focus on that. And you kind of forget for a minute that you had another issue. And sometimes that's all your brain needs. So I like that one a lot. My other pro tip is once you've kind of calmed everything down, you've taken that break, you've reset, then you want to make sure you respond logically. You're not re reacting like this idea I like this proposal I wish it had more in the how we can study in itself. Um, and another practice that I like to use online and verbally is active listening skills. So when I when someone gives a proposal, they share their ideas, I want to make sure I really understand them before I respond. And so I usually say, oh, what I hear you say is, and I will repeat something. And it gives them a chance to correct me if I didn't get something right. And then I can build off of that to make sure we have a shared understanding before I make any suggestions. And then finally, it's really important to know when to switch to a video or voice. You know, there are just times when online communication isn't going to work. Whether it's talking about strategy or it's trying to be able to do. You really just have to know when's the right time to say, hey, let's shift to, to video and talk this through. So I just covered a lot of stuff and I know that was all covered in a short amount of time. So um, I want to just do a quick recap um, just to cover the, the main points that I, I went through today. And that is now more than ever, we need everyone to be leaders in open source. And you absolutely can. You can lead from any position. And you can't lead others until you can lead yourself. So it's important to start there. And leading yourself means that you need to grow your emotional intelligence if you feel that's an area you're lacking in. And the first places to start in building emotional intelligence is self-awareness and self-regulation. And you can grow these areas through a mindfulness practice because it's going to change the neuroscience of your brain is going to keep it integrated. So you're not always being led by emotions and reacting, but you should be responding. And it's also important to not just be mindful and keep that calm, integrated brain. You need strategies at your fingertips so that you know how to respond. And so I recommend you practice ways to reset when you think you're being triggered and use some of those communication strategies to help you respond. And so that, you know, these are some simple steps. 
I'm happy to be available for questions afterwards or beyond this. Um, because there's a lot to this and it's not a topic we discuss much in open source. But I do hope that you will start using these techniques today because it matters. Remember, new contributors are watching you. They're watching how you choose to interact with each other. They're watching how you treat people because that's setting the tone and the culture of the project. And they are going to mimic that. They're gonna model that. And you could be making the difference between gaining the next top contributor of your project or losing someone completely. So I hope you choose to lead and be the leader we all need. So thank you very much for your time today. We can get here. Uh, questions from anyone? Nope. All right. In that case, uh, I will attempt to paraphrase a very long question uh, from Mario. Uh, to clarify, Megan, can you hear me? Uh oh. Can you hear me? A little bit. It's a little muffled, but I can hear you. <laughs> so, Mario's question uh, is about the role of leadership in open source, and particularly Google's role in it, in dealing with the coronavirus crisis that we find ourselves in the middle of. And it has a sort of different character to most of what we deal with because people are literally dying. Um, yeah. Is there, so apart from the sort of, um, here are practical things that we can do as individuals to develop our capacity as leaders, uh, is there any relevant thing you'd comment on on COVID, and is there anything in particular that's relevant in Google's context on dealing with uh, the ability to lead on responses to COVID? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, I'm, I've been very impressed with our CEO's communication um, with internally, um, helping us understand that giving us clear direction um, and helping us understand how to navigate this as humans and employees. And in terms of the outside world, there are many initiatives going on. Um, and we've been putting out a lot of um, messaging around this. And I am actually not properly briefed to tell you all the details. And I wouldn't want to do it, um, you know, uh, it wouldn't, I wouldn't do it justice by going into all the ways that we're helping. I know that there's a lot of resources, a lot of collaboration that we're doing. Um, we're offering our services for free, such as Enterprise G Suite now is being offered so everyone can connect during this time. And um, from where I sit, it's easier for me to speak to this, where I sit in the Open Source Programs Office, we, we fully believe that open source needs to be sustainable and we need to be the best citizens we can be, especially during times like this. We are reaching out to the projects that we use, the foundations that support them. We're reaching out to the industry um, organizations like Open Source Initiative and Outreachy, and we're finding out what the needs are so that we can make sure that we're there to support them. As you know, with event cancellation, a lot of these groups have reliance on event revenue and they use that revenue to support their projects. And we want to make sure that we, and in partnership with lots of other organizations that wanna be good citizens, are coming to help them and make sure that they get through this. And we are also participating in something that's starting up right now called FOSS Responders, uh, fossresponders.org. And what we want to do with this group is create a central page to aggregate people's needs, projects needs, and amplify those needs so that others, other companies, individuals can see how they can help other people in open source. There's going to be a lot of fundraising going on and one of the way, and there's a lot of ways to contribute um, to these people in need and these projects in need. Um, 
both financially and um, in kind through talent and other kinds of contributions. Um, one of the things that FOSS Responders is doing is starting a um, open collective fund to be used to support those that are kind of falling between the cracks that may not be part of a project getting money or may not be a maintainer that's well known that has been impacted. There's gonna be a lot of people that fall through the cracks of some traditional funding that happens in open source. So we wanna make sure we have a way to help them too as so we've created this fund. So um, those are the things that Google Open Source Programs Office is working on currently. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, a round of applause for Megan.